wonderful to be here and a special group to be with. I, I always see Eric uh, Eric's face, and he was my first attending uh, here. Um, and so I always feel a real sense of like uh, cl closure, completion, um, and uh, and comfort actually uh, with having him in the room. So it's wonderful, wonderful to be here and to see a lot of good faces. So you know. Usually when I give talks, I'm either speaking on the global side or I'm speaking on the U.S. side, and sometimes a mix of both. Today, I'm going to give a talk based upon what Bay had uh, requested um, that's U.S. focused. And this ends up using more of my kind of training uh, in, the, in the past uh, that gives kind of more of an economic perspective. And what does it mean for kind of where we are, where we're going? So this is, I've tried to make, to, to tailor us a little bit to what, what does it mean for positions. Um, as we go through this, but this is a, definitely going to be more of a higher level outlook. Uh, and I'm not sure how often we get that opportunity to kind of just take a, a look back and kind of say, where are we going? Uh, and so the goal was to, to do that. So I'm going to go through a bunch of information. Um, as I do that, I'm going to frame each section with a set of probably declarative statements that we can uh, unpack a little bit. So um, I'm going to go through it hopefully in like 40 minutes, um, 35 minutes. And then we can have questions about live issues, whether they relate to legislature, policy, politics, economics, money, whatever. Um, so where are we going? Sector trends and forecast. I wanted to start out by kind of saying that you'll see this trend come up. And you have to be able to see this through all the graphs, which is that um, at the end of the day, we spend a lot of time uh, when you're looking at policy or politics asking, like, how are things going to change? But one of the great privileges of being a physician and, or in a, a care provider of any sort is that we always ask the question of, like, what's going to stay the same? So what's always going to stay the same? And people needing care is going to stay the same. There's certain things that people will always need from health systems that will stay the same. There's certain ways that we relate to people that ought to stay the same. And those are really important guide wires. Otherwise, conversations about healthcare policy configuration systems can kind of just like move over into kind of blind alleys and random places. And you're kind of asking yourself, like, why are we, why are we having these conversations? The reason why I kind of put up a person and say healthcare like politics is personal and local is that every so often you start to see shocks to the healthcare system that like just to kind of yank it like we're in right now. We're in like yanking movements. Um, and you're kind of saying like, what is, what's doing that yanking? And it's, it's people. Like people through some sort of collective effort are doing yanking. And so it's important to just remember technical system, we're a profession, we are in many ways like captains of our own industry, and yet we absolutely get yanked. And we're and, and you have to understand how to work with people through that process and recognize that they're part of the system. Got it. Okay. So anybody know the word secular trends means secular trends? It means like stuff that is um, kind of fundamentals of things that are underlying um, major changes in healthcare, in the healthcare sector. Um, and so what, I, what I'm going to put out here is like three points. I'm going to do this every so often, three big points, and we can talk about them. So secular trends are stuff like we're spending more money on healthcare in America. That's a secular trend. It's happening. It's a fundamental that's shaping the sector. The new national health expenditure report came out in health affairs two days ago. And it says that we're spending in 2016, 17, 17.9% 17 of GDP on, on health care. Um, and um, we're spending more over time. We're going to be spending more. And so the reason why secular trends are important, hey, what's up? Secular trends are important is um, you can have kind of arbitrary discussions about politics or policy or how should we design our health system. But underneath all of this stuff, like these secular trends will shape the conversation whether you like it or not. So like the growing pressure on costs is shaping a lot of different conversations whether you're paying attention to it or not. So it's a secular trend. So they set the passive parameters for decision and action. 
And it's, a, it's important to make them explicit so that you know what's shaping a big element of your conversation. Two is that you temporarily ignore them. So right now, we're temporarily ignoring nationally from a policy perspective that Americans generally would like coverage, health care coverage. All Americans would generally like health care coverage. We're basically actors in the large system is, are temporarily ignoring that. And they might be able to do that. But it's a secular trend, and I'll show you the data, that Americans want to be covered. And so at some point, this, this is going to come back to bite somebody. You know, There's, some, there's going to be some reflex to ignoring the secular trend at some point. And then finally, um, doing anything in the health sector is super complicated. Do actors, unlike a lot of industries, there's not a king of the hill. There's not like the president of the healthcare sector. Um, and then you like talk to their deputies. So even if you think about HHS, does HHS run everything in the healthcare sector? Not really. It's only 50% of, of expenditures. But even within that, it doesn't, it does, like the secretary of HHS doesn't like manipulate a lot of what's happening there. So there's lots of people that drive action. And so if you can't explain what you're doing, um, you, you essentially won't be able to get it to stick and scale. Um, and that's been a problem with the last bit of legislature, the Affordable Care Act. Okay, so this is a graph that people haven't, don't always see. This was in JAMA last week. So um, this is the affordability index. So I mentioned to you that healthcare costs are rising. If you just hear the number that we spend about 20% of GDP on healthcare, is that a lot or a little? Usually we're like trained to say, oh, that's a lot. But we actually don't, you don't know. But maybe it's okay to be spending a lot on healthcare. One of the challenges is that for the American family, does anybody know the, per, the average income of, a, of the American family? 40, 40, 40. Yeah. About 50K, right? $50,000, $54,000, right? So family of four is $54,000. That's the average income of an American, right? And this is saying, look at these dates. Look at this thing. In 1999, out of that, out of that fifty thousand, they're spending seven thousand five hundred dollars on healthcare. Okay. Coming up around here, it's clocking in over thirty percent of their income, and so now we're 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 clocking in at around you know fifteen sixteen thousand dollars out of that fifty is going into healthcare. It's double, double, more than double. So just think pocketbook wise, you know. Politicians, not policymakers, but politicians are trained to think about this graph. Policymakers think about the macro graph. But when you talk about kitchen table conversations, pocketbook, um, you know, politics, this is a pocketbook conversation. So for most Americans, it's unaffordable. And then the other statistic that's important to note is that over the last 15 years, all wage growth in America has been wiped out by increases in prices of health care. So there's been zero wage growth in America since about 2000, 2000 because healthcare has been eating it all up. So this is, a, this is an issue. And, and the reason why I'm taking pains to say that is, is that spending a lot of money on healthcare is not necessarily an issue economically. It can be great. It can be just another engine of growth for the economy. But this is an issue because people are able to less, spend less on other things that they need. This is a trend that you should keep an eye out for. It's starting to change quickly, especially under this um, administration, and it's going to accelerate, not just because of the administration, but because of private trends as well. People are spending more out of pocket. So, not, so even if they've got insurance coverage, they're spending more out of pocket um, on, on, uh, on their health costs. If you look at cardiovascular disease, it actually starts to clock in above $2,500 and $5,000. If you look at certain cancers, it's hitting $5,000 out of pocket. So there's differentials. You, you may not be thinking about it as you're treating all your patients, but basically, whether you're a primary care doctor, or you're an inpatient doctor, people are managing really difficult financial issues differentially depending on their condition that they're dealing with. 
And we may not be sensitized to that, but they probably are very sensitized to that. You can't read all of this, but it's just interesting to note that for whatever reason, we don't know why yet, but the out-of-pocket spending is hitting females much uh, at a much greater degree, probably because uh, things that are pregnancy-related births, uh, pregnancy-related costs are not being covered or structurally accommodated for or are being treated as um, uh, optional you know, coverage, essentially. And, and we know how absurd that is. Um, but that's, that's what, essentially, that's structurally what's being borne out. Um, elderly people, and this is really important because they vote uh, much more than younger people, elderly people are experiencing much higher amounts of out-of-pocket spend than other people. So Medicare um, has gaps in it, and that is increasingly starting to hit uh, pocketbooks of people whose wealth is largely declining in the country. And that finally, um, for whatever reason, there's a huge differential when it comes to what condition you have. So um, we, we actually like somehow, we basically rationalize or um, uh, essentially differentially charge people based empirically based upon condition. And nobody's designing that per se, but this is an effect that you're starting to see. And it probably has something to do in this arena with um, uh, biologics and other drug pricing that's emerging in this area. And so what this means practically as a physician is that you're doing a job of giving the best care you can. And then somebody on the other side is basically freaking out financially because it's crushing them. Um, we know that medical, that, 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 that um, Healthcare costs are the number one reason for bankruptcy in America. And so you're actually, especially at a place like Mount Sinai, at, at a tertiary, coordinary hospital center, you're basically looking at people that are not only trans, essentially in a difficult clinical situation, you can probably look bed to bed. Every fourth person is, fifth person is, that, uh, is experiencing significant financial distress. And some of those people will be going bankrupt because of this nice positive patient experience transaction that's taking place here. So again, just that's happening in the background. Um, and, it, and, and it's important because it, when you think about psycho, psychological distress, you care about that in your patients. Fiscal distress is a major element that's coming forward and is influencing care and their choices. Their avoidance, their treatment avoidance, etc. it's starting to come up. So the reason why I show this graph is that somebody was like, hey, look, I can explain this all to you. Um, and I was just like, uh-uh. And um, so this is a colleague of mine at the University of Washington, an economist that kind of looked at where money's being spent, and they're basically like, look, it's simple. Just follow the lines. And, and this, is, this, is, this is the scenario we're in. And I, I point this out to you is because, like, look, you know, everybody here is very intelligent, and I can actually explain this to you, and you're going to be like, oh, this like, kind of makes sense, right? You're like, oh, I, I know what this stuff is, right? You specifically know what this stuff is more than other audiences. I've helpfully made big circles in here, so you can tell that this is sites of care, you know, types of service, um, and you can tell this is age, right? So, you know, moving beyond the shock of this graph, you can, like, figure it out, and then you're like, what person made this graph, but the point is you can understand it, but, but most people can't. Most politicians can't. Most policymakers can't. And so when you get to the point of complexity in the systems, I'm going to give you kind of a, a pearl from, you know, from, from the policy side, is that as systems become more complex to explain, people demand simpler interventions, like almost irrationally on the other side. So people are looking for simplicity to resolve this complexity, and that's getting us to more complexity and even more simplistic simplicity on the other side. So we're in this like terrible divergence of like really dumb ideas or really hard problems, and that's where we are. And there's been a huge focus from the Affordable Care Legislature on bending the cost curve. You must have heard this phrase. And it's true that growth in, and this is a, a peculiarity of our sector. I work across other 
industrial sectors and nobody speaks in such weird ways as we do. It's like a lot of weasel words. And so basically like we've decreased the rate of growth. Does that mean that costs, that expenditures are going down or are they going up? They're going up, right? Like we've, we've reduced the rate of growth, okay? You get that, you get that, all of you understand that. But when you're talking to policymakers, they're like, oh, health costs are going down. <laughs> they're not, they're going up less quickly, right? And this is actually, it's unclear. Economists generally say that it's not clear if the ACA is bending the cost curve or our economic slowdown during that same period of time is responsible for that. And the reason why it matters is that either you've built some sort of like claptrap legislative mechanism that's somehow tamping down growth, or it's not doing that and it just happened to be that way, it correlates with that. And we're either about to enter a like res resumption of that fast growth rate, or you've actually put in some breaks in the system. And we don't know which one it is right now. It's more likely to be this one than this one. That's what, that's what, you know, these are all mixed effects, but that's largely what the trend information represents. You must have heard that basically drug pricing is a, is, a, is a major driver of expenditures. And what was very interesting is that in the National Health Expenditure Report in, of this year, the increase in hep C, the drug, the, you know, you must have all heard about hep C drug pricing. It's actually shown up as, an, as a dent in the national expenditure now. So like it's pricing and it's, it's price impact is like showing up as like, think about all the gajillion drugs there are and services, et cetera. Hep C itself, that one drug is shown up as like a big, is like a little bit of a divot, so uptick. So one drug, one condition, um, you know, that we think is probably like, it, well, not probably, it is a technological marvel, you know, on one hand. And then on the other hand, it's like it's creating like distorting economic effects that we have no, you know, we're just we're just basically recording that seismic seismograph. We're not doing anything about it. Somebody will. And then finally, we actually don't we have like really bad scenario planning. Like we really don't know. And this is a this turns into being a political football. So how many times have you, how many have you heard the Congressional Budget Office, CDO? Pretty much everybody, right? So CBO is, you know, um, uh, has been, you know, either you treat it as like kind of a, a, a solid source of information, or it's a lot, you know, there's an effort to kind of discredit the CBO. But the point is, the CBO does like scenario planning through very strict rules, but their scenario planning is like high, it fluctuates significantly, no matter what it is. And if you actually look at CBO projections on like Medicaid, Medicare trust funds, et cetera, like they're like consistently wrong in weird ways. And so when you hear Republicans, for instance, saying like the CBO has been wrong, like it's true. And it's sometimes they've been wildly wrong, but like that's what we've got. Like it's like kind of like, are you gonna work with the data you have and we look at it together and make decisions or we just say we have no data. And so let's do things, right? But the point is that we have like a huge variance in what the cost growth projections can look like. And we don't know what drives that variance. Okay, so I've given you kind of big picture like graphs and trends like what the economists do. So let me shift lenses because this is what shapes the politics and then we'll get to the policy. So geography shapes policy and politics. You kind of know this intuitively, like that's how people vote. You've got clusters of people in different states. You look at maps, blue, red, that's how it is. The issue is that, um, who knows the word pleiotropic? Who went to med school? Something like that, right? So pleiotropic means that you can have many, something that has many effects. So I would never say this in a health policy room or with economists because they wouldn't know what that meant. But the idea is that like something like the ACA has like pleiotropic effects across the country. It has many different effects. People feel it very differently. So your wonderful ACA may be ruining somebody's life. Your like terrible policy is like the save somebody's life. And like that's, there's huge variance in how this gets manifest. One issue, and so it's really important to just remember when you're looking at policy, like we sit here in New York City, in New York State, with a set of expectations and a set of effects that we're experiencing that are fairly constrained compared to what is the possible set of 
across the country. So people have different access and coverage options based upon where they live, and they experience health and healthcare trends differently. This is something that people really forget. They're like, why are you stupid? And saying these other things that like, this has been very bad for you. Um, when, when if you just look at the data, like it may be that their premiums have gone up like 500% under the ACA, something like that. And so people experience the effects of complex policy very differently. So again, do that with what you will, except to say that you've got to kind of understand what somebody's talking, where they're coming from as they're talking about things. And then finally, this is kind of like your take it or leave it, that provincial biases, like a New York City bias, generates great regional politics. You can whip everybody up in a frenzy, get your congressman out there, get your senator out there. Um, and that power is basically really bad national policy. And what do I mean by that is that you can kind of say, look, you've got the block of the Texas senators that said this is what health policy should look like. And if they won, so to speak, it would probably be like really not good for New York um, and, and so on. And so what you end up doing, what we're doing right now, is magnifying regional politics and the experiences that a bunch of people are having and then saying, oh, that ought to be national policy. That ought to be federal policy. It's almost like misunderstanding the instruments that we have in front of us. Like we're using like the top shelf, big one, um, and then surprised that it has like really complicated policy and political effects. That's going to happen, by the way, you take away the individual mandate, which we can talk about later. It's, it's actually like unclear, net, you know, net on net, we know what it largely will do. But from a regional politics perspective, it's very unclear what it'll do. And that's going to shape whether or not how it's viewed in general. And it's hard to actually predict that sort of stuff. So let me give you a bit of a geographic point of view and level set. Where is America right now? America is doing poorly in terms of its performance of its healthcare system. And, and this is going to become relevant in a moment. So this is a, an efficiency index from Bloomberg published last year. <laughs> Top 10 country systems, percentage cost, what they spend and their outcomes. Here we have Libya, Belarus, Serbia, America. And, and we're really operating in a very poor mm -hmm. uh, uh, manner, right? <laughs> now, we have parts of our system, even at Mount Sinai, that are probably operating in the top 10. And that's because there are also people that are matched, wealthy, healthy people, come in and get high quality, highly technologically oriented good care. Uh, and then we also have people that are at baseline, poorer, potentially uh, minority, experience barriers to care, have systems that are not really tuned to how they access care, and their care is probably worse than what this indicates. So huge variance even inside our, ge and geography matters immensely for some, for some of this stuff. Which is just to say that, A, the baseline for America is bad, and that for a lot of places in America, it's worse than bad. And let me just put this in context. We've done a bunch of work that will be coming out shortly um, called the Global Advantage Project. And what we're trying to do at a time when global health funding is being gutted uh, is to say uh, essentially um, that there is a huge advantage to America through global engagement. And we can actually clarify what that advantage is. So it fits global advantage project. And so at any rate, this is essentially a graph of life expectancy and expenditures. You have uh, America up here. Where is America? Uh, I don't know where the red dot went. Oh, here. Um, and, um, and essentially, if you look at the bottom decile, 35 million Americans, they're operating at uh, essentially uh, the life expectancy level of a country that's low in middle income countries. So that's, you know, our, really our operating characteristics for at least 10% of our country are, think, are places like, you know, um, Azerbaijan or like, you know, Costa Rica or Rajasthan. Like that's the actual outcome performance characteristics. What's interesting is that if you look at the bottom decile, of US counties, they operate in an America of 1978 in terms of average life expectancy. So you so this is not just cherry picking the worst 10% you know health outcomes in America, which is obviously going to be low. It's saying if you go to the bottom 10% of poorly performing counties in America, they essentially operate in a world of the 1970s in terms of uh, not taking advantage of the advances that we've had, this country's had. 
this sets up this sets up a story about politics, and that's where I'm going with this. One more little fact, which um, economists, you, you know, it's one of these things that will never come up in a healthcare discussion, but it's really important. And if you're like, I don't know why this is important, hope that I won't have done my job well. But the basic idea is that Americans, for reasons that nobody understands right now, are moving a lot less than they ever have historically. So over the last century, Americans are moving about half as much than they ever were. And that's weird. Because in America, in this land of opportunity, people move to opportunity. And they will get up when stuff's not good and go somewhere else. For whatever reason, since 1980s, the mover rate has halved. People are just staying where they are, even if they're miserable. And so local effects are shaping outcomes to a much greater degree than they ever have in the past. And people don't know why that's happening. Economists don't have a good idea, good reason for why there's this massive drop in mobility. This is a really seminal, probably one of the most important studies in the last 10 years out of any field. Um, uh, this is work by Raj Chetty, who was at Harvard and now at Stanford. And it's called um, Equality of Opportunity, a great website. Check it out. And it asks the basic question, if you're born in the bottom decile of income, in America, what is the likelihood that over your lifetime you will go to the highest decile of income? And it's a measure of social mobility. And this is essentially what the map of America looks like. If you're in the South, you know, this kind of Southeast, the likelihood of you being born in the bottom decile and moving to the top decile is very low compared to other parts of the country. And this, in some sense, um, has animated a discussion that basically, like, this is not, in some sense, a land of equal opportunity. We have, like, structural effects that are, have big impacts on your social mobility. And you must have seen a lot of this work in terms of health, depending on where you're born, life expectancy, et cetera, really has a huge impact. And so these, these effects are deepening. And, like, we're, we're, again, we're not really sure why. But it means that in some sense, like we're not actually grabbing the policy issues by the horn. Like we're not really grabbing onto them. We haven't even characterized them well. But something is happening, a secular trend, and it's deepening these effects. Um, and, um, and this is extremely high quality causal level data that shows that uh, places have an impact on social mobility. Furthermore, um, patterns of uh, um, how communities and groups are arranged has a huge impact on social mobility and health. And again, why I'm saying this is because these are the factors that shape the politics and gives you an insight into what policies might actually be helpful on changing the poor health outcome landscape. Um, and, and what's interesting is that when you look at what are have the greatest impact on social mobility and health outcomes, Raj's work has shown that they actually are in basically the housing structure, segregation patterns, and I don't mean this racially, I mean this physically segregation patterns, inequality, school quality, social capital, and family structure appear to have the largest impacts on both social mobility and health. And again, you don't see on here, by the way, hospitals or health systems, and we're going to come back to that in a second. When you say, well, how bad is parts, you know, how, how, you know, how poorly do people perceive their health in certain parts of the country? The answer is like very. Um, and you're starting to see the rise of basically diseases of like third world poverty, um, hookworm in the south. Uh, and uh, you, you, there's actually a lot of work on essentially like birth outcomes and maternal outcomes, um, depending on where you live and uh, minority and, and racial characteristics. And so people are experiencing this, uh, essentially, coming back to my point earlier, that people's feeling of how they are perceiving their health and support around their health is highly variant. And at some point, it animates people to become the top level issue to drive politics and policy. What appears to be the case, and now this is in the land of, now, me, again, I'm, I'm kind of putting down declaratives. 
um, and we can unpack them if you'd like. Americans want simplicity more than choice, and I'll show you data around this. It used to be that Americans were sold choice over the last 15 years, and that led to um, more, you know, essentially more, essentially private entry into our systems. There appears to be like a secular recoil from that, and I'll show you the data behind that. And the more visibly complex a system becomes, the more sim simple people will want it. And this is a, you know, take it or leave it, but that's something that we're ending, ending up seeing. Here's a conjecture. A national health system is on the horizon. And if the tax bill goes through, which is a health bill, um, it will set up, in my point of view, and we'll talk about the trend, I'll show you the polling data, et cetera, it'll set up a major revision. Uh, to the health system. And that healthcare and social sector investments are synergistic and currently being squandered. How many people have heard that we don't spend enough money on social determinants of health? It's not true, and I'll show you what that data looks like. It's just being very poorly uh, integrated. And I'll show you the data behind that. This is an economist uh, figure. Um, and in the land of like rigorous data, it is not. But basically, it shows that the strongest factor, they look at, they look at kind of people that voted for Donald Trump, and um, what, were the, uh, what were the kind of largest principal components of like reasons in their universe that they were more likely to vote for Trump? And hemoglobin A1C, and um, essentially factors around poor health and perceptions of poor health were the highest correlated, not causal, but correlated factors. Um, it turns out that a lot of these settings, and I've got a friend who's running for governor of Michigan, but that's a state that went kind of Bernie and Trump, essentially, in primary to general. And you're really looking for people that are looking for major revisions to their situation. And I will actually drill down into low-income Republicans and show you that they are increasingly keen to have a simple national solution. And so what I'm kind of saying is that an unstable and I've shown you that there's secular instability in our system. It cannot go on at its current growth rate. I have hopefully made a case that it's poorly performing, it's very poorly performing, and that it's complicated, and people perceive that complexity at, in the, at the pocketbook level, right? And what, what this starts to do is it starts to say that this is setting us up for like a restructuring, you know, a, a, and not a technocratic policy, we're going to like make everything nice, a political restructuring. So political will will come into play. Over this last year, there's been a major uptick in saying that the federal government is responsible um, to ensure health coverage. This is a significant uptick. Oftentimes, after major health legislation, people don't like it. They kind of experience the lows of success in some sense. Um, and then they find out that it's hard, and it's complicated, and it's kind of crappy. Um, but, they, but then it rises up again, and look, I just look back in 2008, before there was, again, the ACA level of work. We are rising rapidly into you know, what I call kind of paroxysms of change. Um, if you look at low-income Republicans, um, increasingly favor a role of government and healthcare, and this is the relevant graph here. Among Republicans, lean Republicans, under 30,000, it's gone up. Um, in just the last, uh, in over the course of six months, and it's rising fast, um, now to over half from 30%, and that's rising uh, per trend data. So if you just think about who's animating some elements of politics in the country, um, you're starting to see a convergence between, um, on, a, you know, debt has always been in that direction, but low income and low income uh, on both sides. What's interesting is that Privately insured consumers have a more difficult time navigating coverage and costs. That may, that may like, I'm not sure if that'll strike you as paradoxical or surprising, but in some ways it really shouldn't because they're the ones that are faced with like choices and plans and doctors and devices and everything. Whereas like you kind of like get the cafeteria version of like this is for lunch, um, Medicaid and Medicare. But it turns out that most people that have Medicare or Medicaid um, have far less problems understanding coverage, costs, and what the bottom line is. Most people who are privately insured find it very complicated to navigate and get very upset about it. 
again, this starts to hint to simplicity is being valued more than choice. And in a major restructuring, simplicity may be valued um, over, you know, again, a complicated mechanism like an ACA, whether it comes from the right or left. This is work that's not published, um, and I have the privilege of kind of watching it unfold, and it's very interesting, and I'll show you a bit. Um, there's a group that's been going across the country and asking essentially very different um, um, uh, demographics and voting demographics. So, for example, this is from North Carolina, African-American Democratic women, white Republican women. This has, been re this has been replicated in Texas, now in Minnesota, and a bunch of places, and it says if you've got 100 bucks, and you can allocate it into about 10 areas to improve health, what would you spend it on? And this is an important question. Nobody asks you this question except when you're starting to look at kind of national spending priorities. This is where it comes into play. What's been fascinating, and I think it's absolutely fascinating, is that across all demographics, they allocate nearly exactly the same. And it's kind of stunning um, because these are off only by percentage points. You're not seeing a wild swing between Republicans for hospitals and then Democrats for health centers. You're not seeing a wild swing, you know, nobody likes farmer markets from a certain area, whatever it is, right? <laughs> but, but, but you could. I mean, if, if, the data show, if the data showed up differently, I'd be like, okay, sure. You know, like, that's, that's what it is. But it's showing up consistently across the country that people are allocating in the same way. And so, again, there's a simplicity argument in here. There's something about allocative you know, construction, and there's also like a common, there's a common political and policy message that, that this starts forming the kind of under underbelly. It's not anywhere close to a, a, a legislative machinery, but this, again, trend data that starts to show that there's a lot of odd commonality underneath all of our um, issues. This is just an interesting graph. People often look at me and they say, you know, I've written a book a couple of years ago, I'm working on a couple now, but the, uh, on, on uh, neighborhoods. And people say, oh, you must be a big supporter of social determinants of health funding, housing, et cetera, et cetera. And it's absolutely critical. That said, if you look at both public and private expenditures in the U.S. on uh, these areas, America spends more than other countries. This isn't, by the way, sharp contradiction to work by Elizabeth Bradley uh, and colleagues at Yale. They've written this book called The American Healthcare Paradox, which everybody kind of cites, that shows that Americans, America spends half as much on social spending, and that is why we have poor outcomes. The message is a bit more subtle. It means that we are just a mess in terms of how we organize it, and that our healthcare system does not have care models that successfully integrate across assets, asset sets that our patients find valuable, and we leave the complexity to them. And that's a problem. That's a design problem. And healthcare doesn't care about it, and the social sector is too disorganized to manage it. Uh, and I think that moving leadership will have to come from this sector. So physicians must take an active role, because if you look at a sliding and crappy health system, and you ask who is the most um, visible um, actor, character, that personifies and typifies the American healthcare system, they're carrying a stethoscope around their neck, right? That's, that's a lot of us, not everybody here, but a lot of us. And that means that, you know, as, as, a, as a professor of mine or, uh, or an advisor of mine at one point, uh, Howard Zinn, he's a history professor, said you can't be neutral on a moving train. And physicians cannot be neutral on this moving train because we have a critical role in creating a seamless care journey. And I, and I phrased it this way because we have to cross asset classes that we're not used to doing. And so it doesn't mean that everybody here has to become passionate about housing. You may not care at all about housing, but just like you may not care a lot about heparin, you have to include heparin into how you want to do your care, right? And you may be passionate about something else. Whatever your passions are, nobody cares in the sense that you have to incorporate it in order to get to good care. And so, you know, there are some basics out there that we need to figure out how do we incorporate in the way that clinical journeys work. And a clinical journey is not just referring somebody to something. It's just like saying, hey, I'd love for you to look at our medicine service 
now that you're on like OB. I think you've got some issue. I'd refer you guys there. I hope it's, hope it's great. You know, goodbye. We don't do that. We actually have mechanisms to ensure that you have a mostly a seamless care journey, right? Patients don't perceive the transition from Penn Center to some other part of the hospital as being a different, entirely different episode to our credit. If they do, then that's a challenge, right? Then we work on that. So we have to create a seamless care journey, and that stuff. Two is that we have to massively reduce overhead of the infrastructures, the physical infrastructures, this, this building, this really nice set of physical infrastructures, are the anchors around the neck of the, uh, of the healthcare sector. So we have, to, we have to massively reduce them, find new ones, find ways to repurpose them, or we go down with them. Stethoscope plus a massive building is the story of our demise. And then third is that we have, to, we have to do direct advocacy for shared goals of patients and communities because, again, it is policy and politics are at stake. How you do that, I'm not saying everybody needs to turn into big, a big activist for X, but your patients do need to understand how the environment's changing, and they've got to see the physician as the advocate on their side. If they don't, you won't be. So let me run through this, and I'm over time, what I said. Um, the upshot here is that there's a lot of clues about what people want and what does seamless look like. You've got to define all these terms. Well, what does seamless mean? And then we've got to define, technically, saying, is that good care? There's a, there's a dialogue here. It's not just kind of a, you know, have it your way, Burger King style development of a health system, although that's coming too. Um, secondly, is that we have to understand willingness to pay because consumers are paying more for their care. I won't go into this. There's a great list of stuff people want, and we have to make sense of it. This is what people want. They want, you know, all this stuff. All the other stuff that you do, they don't want it. They need it sometimes. <laughs> they need it sometimes, and they can't recognize it. They don't know why they're getting it, and that creates a lot of confusion. And we've got to figure out what's happening here. This also is actually probably the area of like boom investment in the healthcare sector. It's a great list of like a little short list of stuff people are spending a lot of money on. Sometimes useless, and sometimes useless. Um, it's very hard to shift this clinical infrastructure. It's very difficult to do all this work. We take care of patients, but we need to think about care models. We need to think about the design of our systems and physicians need to take a proactive role in that. We were part of leading, and this, and this type of department is part of leading a QI revolution. There's a design revolution that needs to be picked up. Um, otherwise, we will be in a lot of trouble. Um, you know, these are kind of platitudes, and yet they're also important because they're simple enough. People get it. But then we have to enact them, and it's very hard. And explaining this to everybody that's involved is very difficult. Um, but this, this is part of the work at hand. Um, I, I won't, uh, you can scan this, but this is an idea from uh, December 8th, is today's day? 8th? Might be. Um, <laughs> JAMA. Um, and basically saying, somebody's saying, look, you got to start, you got to start writing to your patients. Tell them what's going on. And I think that uh, as a, as part of a discharge note, as part of how we interact with them, it doesn't have to be overtly political, but you need, we need to start telling them that we are, we are paying attention to their environment. We know that stuff's changing. And we gotta say, we're with you, but we're not here to solve all the problems. We wanna advocate with you. And we want you to pay attention. Organizations that don't start doing these things are gonna be in trouble when it comes to when our dish payments get cut, when X gets cut. Nobody can understand it outside. And nobody's advocating for it except for our lobbyist groups. And that's a very brittle political position. And then this is the last one. Um, Forces beyond healthcare are going to shape it now. If um, tax reform passes, which looks, I would put odds as decent, we will, despite uh, Senator Collins getting in writing whatever she got in writing, we're going to see major restructuring to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. That paves the way for larger scale change down to, to come because things are going to be kind of really broken. Second is that consumer companies are going to start competing to redesign the care interface. Aetna, CVS, Amazon's about to make a major entry. It's going to happen really fast now. 
So consumer companies are saying, you guys don't know how to create a seamless journey across all these assets, we will. And that's gonna be a big internal pressure. And then finally, physicians, I think, if history is our guide, are gonna retrench and go right back into the foxhole that we are and, and say this is where we gotta be. And it's gonna take people at academic medical centers, people on the edges, and that's where leadership opportunities come. When I say physicians, I don't mean the people here necessarily in this room, but the bulk of physicians in America are gonna say, hey, whoa, you guys are you're trying to change stuff too fast, we gotta go back and hold on to what we got. And while that may be partially true, there's gotta be a group of people that says, okay, well, this is the way to thread that needle forward. And hopefully they're in this room. Ben. <laughs> We have a couple of questions. Yeah. So one, do you know about like simplicity and transformation? What about the concept, especially if some of these things come to pass and we need something more, you know, dramatic, like Medicare for all? Like, you think we're, are we ever going to be a place where universal health care uh, or or a single payer system is going to be feasible? So we can't operationally execute that today. So if we said Medicare for all, like we wouldn't know how to, you know, get out of that gate. We'd like trip on our shoelaces as we walk out. That said, this is part of where the politics and the policy, you know, they, they, they essentially are preparatory. They're saying, hey, get ready, get ready, get ready. What would that mean? What would that mean? I, I, going through med school, I heard, you know, there was always a group that positioned something uh, single payer or national health. System. There's some group that does that always talks about that stuff. But that largely has been a kind of a fringe group. But now everybody's talking about, well, what would this mean? That's stupid. That's silly. That's great. And that's starting to drive preparatory action. So I would say, you know, the universal health coverage is always a strategy for a nation. It is not a legislative answer. Because you've got to, like, move the population. You've got to figure out some stuff. You've got to patch in some stuff. You've got to deal with exceptions. And you've got to find the, 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 the way forward. And so, in short, um, Medicare for all is not going to, you know, it, it is if it happens, it's going to be a, one of those big leaps. And we're going to everybody's going to find ways to make it make sense. Uh, but I, I, I think um, it sets us up for like 15 to 20 years from now, something like that. My general sense is that we will have a basic coverage with a defined service package and then add-ons that allow for entry of reinsurance, gap coverage, all sorts of like stuff that comes on the, on the plate, but with a base of national coverage. That's my, my sense. Yeah. So I, I so I've um, I, I've been um, I gave a lecture at Columbia to their economics department yesterday, and I expressed my, as I said, probably one of the most singularly unhelpful randomized control trials in like the last ten years coming out of economics, um, by people that are just very smart. And the challenge is that you've got two years, they had 18 months of Medicaid data to look at chronic condition outcomes. Um, and essentially, like it's, it's like a deeply ambiguous set of outcomes. And we as physicians have to look at that like length of time and ask, like, when would you expect to see population health outcomes? And 18 months are good for readmissions, they're good for a bunch of process indicators, outcome and cost indicators in a system that was not set up in the labor on those things are hard to say. That said, Medicaid is a challenging program, period. Um, it's, it's definitely a tier below in terms of care for a bunch of reasons that we may not see at Sinai, we do, but like their, their specialty access, et cetera, is complicated, wait times. So at any rate, I wish it was more helpful. It is not. And, um, and I hope that we will see things that are more helpful. Benjamin Summers at Harvard School of Public Health is doing probably the most helpful deeper dive into the effects like that across the country. And he's shown a very different effect profile. Similarly rigorous body of work. If, um, if you got to be that person that doesn't exist who is in charge of the entire yeah. healthcare system, what would be your first steps if you didn't have to worry about any you know, political support? What would be your first steps to? I, I, I would just, I would just, I would make a, 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 a coverage across the nation, and then, but I would define it as a, as a as a service package. So it has to be a cap definition of a national of a national coverage plan. Like I think that's your opening gambit, 
and everything else is just a real mess. Um, and uh, I didn't feel that way, by the way, three years ago. And so I, I think that there's a lot of learning that's been taking place. And I think that it concords with politics, policy, and technical stuff in a way that I didn't appreciate before watching just so much dynamism take place. So that would be my opening. When you talk about simplicity, it really sounds to me like you know, formally your support of transparency more than simplicity itself and this feeling of feeling continually duped by you know, the, the system being bankrupted and just wanting to know what to expect. So with, as a healthcare system, as an outside it, what are we doing to meet that desire from our consumers? Yeah, um, so... I would, I would just point out that uh, maybe it's not simplicity, but it might be a straightforwardness, but it's not transparency. Because transparency sometimes like lets you see underneath the like hood in ways that you don't want to see. So we know, for instance, that when, you're, when you expose consumers to pricing, they don't know what to do with it at all. And, like it's been shown over and over and over again. People don't shop for healthcare very well. They don't shop for healthcare. Very few people do. And so you actually have exposure we're like, oh, that's helpful. You know, you might just like rank lists. Even when sent a letter, there was a study from Penn, even when sent a letter that says, this is the best plan for you in the market, and it's better by a lot, people won't switch. Mm -hmm. So like information shocks also don't do much for people. They don't move, they don't change. And they, they end up cycling really randomly. Now, by the way, if you look at your own Sinai plan uh, information, which has been slightly simplified over this last year, when I said it again, you're just kind of like, uh, <laughs> my wife who has an MBA, and maybe she can figure it out. <laughs> but, you know, like, that's the situation I'm in. Like, you know, it's like, uh. But I think straightforwardness is a different issue. So it basically says, like, we're not covering you. You've got this package. You're going to have to pay this. This is what it is. You know, like this is what it's gonna. This is what this transaction's about, and we're in this like really goofy space of being like, ah, it's not like that. It's about more than that. You've got like a thing going on you and me, the people, and so like, yeah, we'll cover you. Like we got you, but like actually it was hard. But I got you. <laughs> and instead, saying like, hey, yeah, there's relationships and there's a transaction, and people need clarity and they need continuity. And so I think that's we have to just kind of differentiate those two things. And so what is our system doing? I'd say like the, the most simple, you know, if, again, if that magic wand question and, and what we're working on right now, is like there's not a single billing entry point to our system. Have you ever been a patient here? Yeah. Have you ever gotten bills from this place? They're crazy, right? And then the, then the post adjudication, and like I never know what actually is our bill. And I just wait until like collection. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, you know, it's a bad place for a business to be in. Right? And so, like, just a single billing container is really operationally hard for a whole lot of reasons, but it's a, it's a worthy task because that's one of the bottom line interactions that people have with us. And so, the challenge is that we don't even have the capability set in the organization that's part of what we're building to do that sort of thing. It doesn't exist. Uh, a 40,000 person organization, $8 billion of revenue, you know, uh, 300 sites. You just don't you don't have that capability set. So we're building it for the first time. So these these are the types of things that just like create a straightforward, you know, helpful interaction. You call Sinai? Have you ever called Sinai? Don't. I mean, like, <laughs> really, like it's 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 a it, you know I, I think the challenge and you should actually you should call Sinai. Call Sinai. Mm -hmm. you see what your patients have to do. Mm -hmm. And look, all of us are involved in improving call centers. Like we work hard. People work really hard on these things. But it is not a pleasant experience. And these are, you know, like, what should be a, one of our number one tasks you can do well? Like, book an appointment. Because we got to see you, right? Mm. Super hard. Mm. You know, another task, you should be able to get paid. Super hard. Mm. People should be able to, like, ask a question and get help. Super hard, right? And so you start to ask, like, what are the bottom line things that we should be able to do? Mm. We see attention coming to those things. But managing that across a complex, unintegrated, scaled infrastructure is hard. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with that. Mm -hmm. I think we're uh, we cool. got the uh, yeah. Thank you very much.